Thank you. Cool. So we are going to start. So we'll allow these lovely people to introduce themselves, and then I will open with the questions. So John. Jen. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm John. I have had over 20 years of doing cybersecurity, crypto, um, and so on, and everything from big cloud systems to tiny subsystems on microchips. Uh, but lately, I've been most interested in things like smart cities. So I spent the last three or four years um, dabbling, maybe, in, in things like airports, uh, self-driving vehicles, um, and, and things like that. And then, on the 1st of January this year, I founded a company specifically dedicated to uh, helping with the challenges of the exploding complexity of automation, smart cities, uh, energy delivery, things like that. Cool. Uh, hi, I'm Holly. Well, that's for the video. Oh, do you need both? Oh, I need both of them. Yeah. Oh, excellent. I'll hold it in this one. So I'm Holly. I am a software engineer on the Cortana for Windows so at Microsoft. Um, I started my career working on Paint 3D, so a little bit different. So I was working on democratizing 3D creation for the masses. Um, and then I went to work on Xbox, and so I was developing features that would um, be on off-console experiences, so things that were on PC as well as on VR, so I got a bit of a taste in that. Um, and now I work on Cortana for Windows, and so I'm working more in the virtual assistant space, kind of trying to figure out some of these unanswered questions about how people are going to be interacting with virtual assistants, what kind of value can they get from them, and how you can kind of balance between using like text, speech, things like that, and sort of finding the best way to deliver people the information that they want in kind of the method that they want to be delivered in. Um, hi, my name is Marta. Um, I've been with, uh, in technology since the day that I started studying, not before that, um, which was 11 years ago. Uh, so yeah, I come from a very humanities background and then as I started my studies I decided to go into computer science and uh, did my PhD in security and privacy, uh, but actually never really worked in that field, mostly focused on uh, blockchain. Uh, so I've been current, uh, with Hyperledger currently for three years now. Hyperledger is an open source project under the Linux Foundation focusing on enterprise blockchain uh, solutions. And I'm a director of ecosystem there. Kind of looking at use cases, looking at our community, community building, but also helping people understand the value of uh, blockchain in enterprise setting. Um, hi, I'm Sharon Musayebi. Um, I spend most of my time at academia. Um, did physics, then cryptography, then back to quantum cryptography. Then eventually I got out of academia, did a bit of consulting in cybersecurity, got bored, decided to do a startup in 2016, uh, which was Crypto Quantique. And crypto stands for cryptography, to just make it clear here. Um, um, uh, the idea was to, and still is, to combine quantum technologies with modern cryptography in an integratable economical way to solve some burning cybersecurity issues, especially around IoT or, or connected devices, as we call it. Um, um, we are over three years old now. Uh, we got products uh, to, uh, to basically provide multiple unforgeable uh, device identities and cryptographic keys per device and a key management service on the cloud side for enterprise to be able to manage the devices through their device lifecycle. Uh, obviously, uh, aiming for connected devices, smart cities is one of the biggest market, uh, an interesting application uh, that we, we come, uh, come across it. Um, and yeah, happy to be here. Talk cool. about it. Uh, we're also hiring in case you guys <laughs> <are> <laughs> interested. Talk to them afterwards at the club. Cool. All right, then. So let's start with the first question. We'll, we'll, we'll mix it up, but we'll, we'll go ladies first. So, Marta, your favorite two innovations. They could be like a reality now, or they could be like a pipe dream that might not even exist yet. Please share. Well, I have a private answer to that question, but come and ask me afterwards. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure if I want to get that on video. Uh, but in general, mobile devices, I think that this is something that completely, specifically smartphones. That really changed the way that we interact, uh, the way that we communicate but also just the way, if you think about it, um, when I was younger and I met a boy uh, during summer, I had like five minutes flirt with him and then I went home and I never saw him again. Uh, these days uh, I happen to have a 
17 year old girl at home and uh, she is in long distance relationship and actually never lived in the same city as her boyfriend for the last three years. Uh, so this really changes the way that we interact and this is really important to me. The second one is uh, 3D printed drugs um, because that's something that just blows my mind. The fact that we can design a drug so that it gets released in the right moment and it's a combination of five drugs and we just make sure that they don't interfere with each other and so on. That I just don't understand how that's possible. I didn't even know they existed. <laughs> <laughs> Holly, what's yours? Um, I'm obviously incredibly biased and so I'm super interested to see where the future of virtual assistants is going to take. We are right at the beginning of this process and um, a lot of people too tend to think that the virtual assistant space has already been kind of taken over by your big dogs like your Amazons and your, and your Googles, but if you start actually kind of looking at really the quality of the responses that you're getting back and what people are actually really asking these, these kind of virtual assistants, a lot of the time it ends up being like, hey Alexa, play Spotify. Like that's kind, that's kind of the depth that we're reaching at this point and so it's kind of it's interesting to me to see what kind of real value that we can be doing and actually, at least on a Microsoft side, what kind of like productivity that we can start adding to people by really cutting down the amount of steps that people have to go through and really adding like proper natural language to these kinds of services so you don't have to spe specify like very specific queries to get them to do what you want. You can really start to speak to them like you would an actual assistant and actually like use the language that you would normally do and not have to specify context of like, oh, okay, I've asked for like, when is my meeting with this person? And now can I like t several turns later be like, oh, okay, can you actually also send this email to this person? And they would just know because it would just be in built into the fabric of these virtual assistants. And so I'm quite curious to see actually how good we can really make these technologies because I really do think that we're mm -hmm. quite at the beginning of this process. It's only been the last couple of years that we started exploring this. Um, my, uh, my not so existing dream is, I'm, at least I'm a contact lens wearer, and so I'm quite curious <laughs> to see if we could do like heads up display through contacts. I think that would be really cool to be able to have like a feed come up or directions <laughs> given to me as I just look around. It gets a little bit creepy. Or panel questions. Panel <laughs> questions, yeah, a little, little search over here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm quite curious to see if we can do some of those technologies. I've seen very, early articles written about this stuff, but very early. So we'll see, we'll see what ends up coming our way. Okay. Shahram, you've got a mic. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think I'm more interested in intersection of these new technologies. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we're living in an era that we have so many interesting things happening, like as, such as AI, AR, VR, um, biotechnology, uh, 3D printing, um, uh, quantum computing. Um, and I think what I'm really interested to find out is what going to happen in intersection of those technologies. What going to happen when we combine our AI algorithms with the power of quantum computing to train our algorithms? Uh, what happens if we use quantum computing power to do an a a AR uh, uh, type applications? Um, what going to happen if we manage to solve some uh, big problems uh, in, in biochemistry uh, to do some drugs, whether it's 3D or, or not, but more targeted type drugs with different type of um, uh, effect. So for me, I'm, w w I think we are so advanced in so many um, uh, uh, areas. And but what I'd like to see in maybe next 10, 20 years is what happens if any of those fields get kind of entangled um, mm -hmm. and get combined. Quantumly entangled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> okay. John. Right. Um, so, for me, I, mean, I always get a bit sort of torn with these questions because they say that sort of technology is just everything that was invented after you went to high school and <laughs> innovation is everything that hasn't happened yet. And yet, if you look backwards in time, I mean, honestly, things like writing and formalization of the number zero are probably the most mm. impressive things that have ever happened. But as far as sort of con <laughs> contemporary uh, innovation goes, uh, there's a couple. So not within my field of expertise, but I think very important indeed was um, CRISPR. And it, the, mm. the idea that you can massively accelerate 
proper, well, scary or not, uh, technology has no morals, right? So, <laughs> but I think you know, even, even outside of the, the sort of common, slightly scary uh, sort of DNA bioengineering, you know, genetic bias kind of stuff that people spread around, the, the possibilities for smart cities, for smart living, of engineering organisms that are actually able to eat the stuff that's otherwise bad for us and grow um, is, is just incredibly um, good, I think, and, and, and is going to yield a lot more good than, than bad. Um, and the other one, uh, to take a sort of more straight down the line technology approach, I think is risk five. And it took us a long time. For, for those of you who don't know what risk five is, um, Today, pretty much every computer you own has an Intel chip in it, and Intel chips are quite expensive. Um, every mobile device you have in it pretty much probably has an ARM chip in it, uh, and ARM chips cost quite a lot to license. Uh, RISC-V is finally a, a, an attempt to make free open source hardware. Um, that's not to say that you get actual chips for zero pounds, uh, but it's to say that you can take the design, send it off to a foundry, and they will essentially just charge you the price of the sand and the process to get your chips out without any of the, the licenses. I think in the context of the smart cities, this is super important because if you're going to make things smart, that means basically everything has chips in it. And right now it is not possible or feasible to sign all the contracts you need to sign to pay all the money and the licenses and the royalties that you need to pay in order to have all those bits of stack. And frankly, it's a waste of time for every single company, you know, every Microsoft, Amazon, Google, every uh, Bosch, Siemens, Honeywell, whoever, mm. to all invent the same thing in a silo separately with their own patent pools. We need to share. Um, as Lara said, you know, this is a co-creation effort. There's absolutely no point in creating the same thing in the world more than once. Uh, and this actually takes the open source qualities of software that have made the internet possible uh, and moves that into the hardware domain, which I think is going to be really, you know, it'll be under the radar and nobody will ever talk about it at the breakfast table, but it is going to have a big impact. I really love how you've brought that up because that's one of these paradigm shifts I was uh, talking about a bit earlier. Um, if you look up Jer Jer Jeremy Rifkin, he talks a lot about the sharing economy, and that's a lot about what IoT is going to enable. So, you know, if you actually want to sustain the planet <laughs> and our cities, rather than like one, one power plant or whatever, just creating all this energy, you've got to share it out amongst everything. But then that's like the sharing economy applies to everything. It could be your house. Apparently, um, in America, I didn't know this, but you can actually rent your car out. So a bit like Airbnb, but apparently when you're at work all day, you can rent your car out. It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, Have you done it? Oh, many times. Oh, wow. I, I, lived, yeah, really I cool. lived in States, so I, I used it a lot. Yeah. And the best part of it is that you can actually, like, Thank you. <laughs> the best part of it is that you can actually like rent out a super old school Mustang or mm -hmm. a very cool. fancy Porsche and just go for a ride for two days to LA and feel like a movie star. <laughs> there we go. So, okay. So yeah, the whole, this sharing everything and not reinventing the wheel. It's like, this is why technology is just moving faster and faster and faster. So, what do we want to talk about next? I think, let's go with AI. So one of the things that scares me is like being a mindless sheep just controlled by AI. Like you literally only get presented the reality based on your past choices or what your friends see. So question for the panelists, there's, there's a big topic on AI algorithm ethics. And like for, and what it means is like, could you sue the algorithm? Is it a person, is it an entity? Could you sue them for making a choice for you or maybe not presenting? all the choices. Mm. So open to the panel, whoever wants it first. AI algorithm ethics. Any scary stories? Mm. Oh, here we go. Uh, Hi. I mean, Cortana has to answer Cortana. <laughs> hey, Cortana. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've, I've done a bit of reading around this space, and I'd say that if you're sort of new in this area, even, even not new, a couple of good books to read is um, Hello World by Hannah Fry. Um, that's quite a good uh, kind of introductory into algorithms and AI and ethics sort of around that and she covers a good couple spaces. Um, and then the other one I've been reading recently is called Invisible Women. Um, and so both of those I've sort of been gathering kind of like some of my information across those as well as some different talks that have been given at Microsoft and my job as well. Um, but I'd say I've, I always find it quite, this is quite a challenging question Ooh. because it's difficult with these kinds of AI algorithms. A lot of this information or these algorithms are proprietary, proprietary information. And so if you have a problem, how do you actually prove it's the algorithm? Like you don't know what goes into the algorithm. You don't know what decisions are being made. You don't know what information is being put into it because it is a company's 
private knowledge, basically. It is their own thing. Um, as well as then there's the question of like, okay, who do you actually sue if you do that? Do you sue the third party that is using this algorithm? Do you sue the person that made the algorithm, the company? Or do you sue the person that made the decision that, I mean, if you know what's gone wrong, and then who actually made that decision? So there's quite a few questions around who do we sue, how do we sue, and how do we actually get to know what the problem is? Um, I think some of my other some of my other questions around this is the, probably the reason why I guess you are suing is because you think the response of what you've gotten out is unfair. Um, and a lot of that, at least in my mind, some of the things I've been reading about is they're unfair is because a lot, there's a lot of data bias that ends up going, that's feeding into these algorithms. And this data bias comes from a few places, which is like there's just not enough data or there are gaps in this data. And so they're being fed into these algorithms and this historical data bias is being fed into what is being making decisions in our present day and are kind of aggravating and potentially like accelerating these, these biases that are coming out. Like I think probably a few of us would have heard about, um, I think it was Amazon, I'm not sure about um, one of these companies who was using this algorithm to kind of like vet CVs before they actually get in and it was oh, like that's, that's more that's a lot yeah, yeah there's loads yeah. of them right and so but it's like okay well you see like oh good <clears throat> white men are really good software engineers because they're the ones that have always been software engineers and so unless you have that on your CV the, or whatever then it ends up getting fed into the fact that like oh, okay someone like me or some of the other people here wouldn't be a good, seen as a good candidate because previously they weren't the ones that were being hired in these roles. Um, the other part ends up coming down to the people who are deciding which kind of information that is really useful in this <laughs> algorithm. Um, and so like Invisible Women talks a lot about how, um, it's in this case, particularly w like women, it was the focus of how we have different opinions and perspectives and life situations that mean that we have different value that we can be adding into these situations. And so some information that could be really useful isn't being actually even given to the algorithm in the first place or isn't being emphasized. And so for me, it's quite, it's quite a, a few areas where there's, it's not a simple question or it's not a simple answer. Yeah. A lot of these questions I'm gonna ask, you could have a whole event. You could have a whole event. <laughs> I just really wanna like get everyone's awareness up, so does anyone wanna add anything on AI? She's gone on a monologue. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very interesting monologue. Um, from the other side of things, I think that why we are so excited or people are excited about AI, also in my domain is uh, smart contracts, is that this basically delegates the responsibility all of a sudden there is this machine that is responsible and there is this algorithm that is doing everything. So not a single, like today if you sign a contract and uh, your lawyer advises you to sign a contract and it goes bad, you just sue the lawyer. If you, your doctor screws up your, uh, uh, your whatever surgery, you sue the, uh, the doctor. But if it was an algorithm that, or you know, the, the robot that performed the surgery and well, you know, it's not a human being. You put, yeah, you could put a robot into a jail, but I don't think this is really <laughs> punishment to anybody. So I, I think that it beautifully kind of uh, feeds into not willing, uh, lack of willingness to, to take responsibility for our actions. Oh. Mm. It, it, it may, I think if I may yeah, get yeah, no, a, a little bit of spice. So I worked on this in my previous, um, mm -hmm. in my previous role. I worked in a defense company, uh, aerospace company, in fact, looking at all sorts of technologies that can make all sorts of quite serious applications work better. Yeah. And when you start to compare the reality of AI in real world applications to the press image of AI, you quickly discover that the two are very, very far apart indeed. Um, and actually everything, pretty much everything that we have today that's called AI is just automation. And we already know exactly what to do when somebody writes bad software. Is we sue the person who put the thing into service. And that's it. That's simple. If you look at things with um, self-driving cars, for example, we know exactly where the responsibility lies in those kinds of in those kinds of places. And when you look at planes, we know where the responsibility lies. There, you, there was never any ch any reason to change any of the regulations or the legal framework. Pilot is still ultimately responsible for deciding whether a plane is ready to fly. Whether it's fully analog or fully digital, it doesn't matter. You see what's in there and you assess whether it's good enough. And that's, um, it's that simple. So actually, 
Okay, those of you sort of intimated, and I was kind of sound like your 80 year old uncle at parties, and I tell this joke at every place I go to, so I'm going to keep Jones, doing it. Like but don't get, my favourite, it's also my only AI joke, but it's my favourite AI joke. Okay, an AI walks into a bar, says to the barman, I'll have what everybody else is having. But because that's basically what everything does today, the, the root of everything we have right now is either computer vision based, which is entirely about tagging and similarity yeah. assessment, or it's trend based, which is entirely about telling you what thing to buy next or what music track to listen to next, which is not ever, ever going to get us close to AGI, which is what people are all worried about. So there are plenty of actually quite sensible, skilled people in places like Montreal working on explainable AI and serious actual AGI. The reason you don't hear about that is because it's very hard and they're taking a very long time over it. But yeah, honestly, I'm not worried about this stuff. <coughs> so, I'm going to step in there. So basically, I wanted to, I'm going to segue into the next question. Um, so AI has actually been around since the like, 50s, 60s, 70s, but it's just not financially viable or possible to really use it because we didn't have the computing power to do it. Yeah. But I was, I was joking with my uncles uh, the other day. We had my cousins around, so my uncles were all in IT, and they were saying, you know, that hard drives were like, I don't know, 250 meg used to be like the size of a sofa. <laughs> and we just had Amazon deliver a two, two terabyte thumb, like literally the size of my thumbnail. Mm. Like literally 24 hours later it arrived. But so with AI, what's gonna be the big game changer with all of this IoT, big data that we have to analyze is quantum computing. So, the next question, which we do have some quantum cryptography experts on the panel here, quantum versus cryptography. Yeah, okay. What do we need to know about this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know about this stuff. Um, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really necessarily put it quantum versus cryptography. Mm. Or so, AI, because now we can do uh, AI, enables an AI, AI in the smart system. Sure, um, I mean... Uh, Quantum technologies, such as any other technologies like AI, is a new technology. Um, cryptography has been around for, for many years now. Um, so pretty much we kind of know what it can do, uh, what we can do with it, what are the limits, uh, where we can innovate to scale. Uh, so kind of have a good sense of what's happening there. On, on, on quantum technologies, we're still not sure where, where the limits is. We, we understand some... Uh, difficulties, for instance, to realizing a proper quantum computer, uh, but we, we're not quite sure what exactly then it can do for us. Um, so when, uh, as, but as, as a new technology, uh, it have a good side, it could have a dangerous type of bad side, but I think it's kind of up to us how, how we use it. So uh, usually when people talk about quantum um, computers and then the moment they say cryptography, all they talk about is ah, all the cryptographic stuff that we have today, all the security that we have today is broken, a couple of years, we are doomed, it's gloomy, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's not really the case. Um, it kind of takes ages to have a, that quantum computer that be, will be able to do the same. In the same time, we could just change the type of cryptographic algorithm that we're using today, which are safe against those type of quantum computers coming around. Yeah. But at the same time, quantum computers because of their intrinsic uh, um, randomness that, that they've got, they could add a lot of value into security and cryptography. And th essentially that's where we're playing, that's, that's the game CryptoQuantic tr tries, tries to play. So um, you can benefit a lot from, from quantum technologies right now uh, as, as, as it grows. Um, you need to be aware of the dangers that it could pose to, to, the, to the infrastructure that I'm to plan and already a lot of plan been in place um, and I think I'm, I'm not too worried about it to be okay. honest. All right. uh, can Do I have a quick question yeah, to the audience? Get your questions from um, the audience. How many You're of you actually here. understand quantum computing? Okay, so maybe... You're not everyone with your hands up, you're lying. It's not true. So maybe just like five seconds on, on quantum computing. Okay. What, is, um, what is it? <laughs> the ultimate challenge. <laughs> well, so the, the, the idea is in, in, a, uh, in a classical uh, uh, world that we live in, uh, we only could have one, um, um, one position or one bit that, that we can compute on. So at, at each, uh, in a computing process, we could just go step by step, do some sort of form of computation on one form of bit, get an output, then do something else on it. In a quantum world, um, you have 
an estate which is known as a superposition estate, which is a combination of all possible um, uh, uh, um, variation of a system. Um, so in case of bits, for instance, we have zero and one, so a quantum state that represents uh, a bit, or known as qubit, at the same time essentially is zero and one, and we don't know which one it is, unless we actually measure it. So, so when you compute on, on, on a quantum state, it's like you're running a function at the same time on two bits, zero and one, and you just keep continuing that. So in, in a process when you just keep doing that, instead of you, you, get, you get to have an exponential speed up compared to a classical version, because each time you basically double the, t the, the type of computation that you're doing. Um, but that's just a quantum state, so you still don't know what the answer is. Uh, uh, <laughs> at I don't the think end, anyone's any clearer. <laughs> 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 sure. Would you say it's a little bit more similar to the way that human brains work, in a way where we can kind of hold Parallel. a lot of information in our head? Uh, quite the, it enhances the human brain in my world. Um, not, not, not really, to be honest. Um, <laughs> um, well, we could, we'll discuss more about Sure, that. of course. I think yeah. maybe a couple of questions from the audience, because you guys have obviously been listening if, to it. I can correct me if I'm wrong. The, the way that I think of quantum computing is uh, you've probably, most of you saw the um, Black Mirror to Zero Adventure thing. So that's kind of how quantum computing works in my, my, my headspace, which is basically I start at some point and all of the, um, the decisions or the, the endings of, to that story are defined. I just don't know which one will be the one that I'll arrive to. Like if you were the god or the, the, the script writer, you would know which path leads to what. But me as a person who is watching Black Mirror, I have no clue. All of them, them are possible, at some, depending on how I choose it. Probably easier. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard one. Who has a question? Oh, you put their hand up. Come on, someone must have a question. Oh, wait, we need a mic. We need a mic. <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously, um, uh, that gives you an exponential uh, computing power. So the, the question is, um, um, in, in mathematical situation, we have this complexity theory that explains uh, mathematical, uh, mathematical problems have different level of uh, difficulties in order to be solved. Um, and we know theoretically that some of, the, uh, those, some of those mathematical problems cannot be solved in real, in considerable amount of time um, with, with current computing power that we have, classical ones. Uh, but but when, we, when we consider, again, theoretically, uh, this exponential speed up that quantum computers might be able to give us in real life, then some of those problems can be solved. So it essentially could give you an edge that you can solve some hard problems that thought to be impossible to solve with, quant with classical computers, but when quantum computers are around, they, they are, we are able to solve them. Can I have a thing? Yeah, of course. So, yeah, so using, using that property, I, mean, I, think, I think it's actually really unhelpful, usually, that every time anybody asks what quantum computing is, they start by saying what a classical computer is, and then <laughs> say what com quantum computing isn't. Uh, they're completely different, and trying to explain things in terms of uh, superposing zeros and ones, it almost gets there, but as soon as you start to understand, you realise that the analogy breaks down, it doesn't make any sense anymore. It's, it's just, it's analogue, it's wavy, it's approximate, forget that. But the nice thing about that is that chemistry is fundamentally wavy and analogue and approximate. And so um, right now, there's a, a challenge to all science. Because the idea is that science basically starts off with a, a hypothesis and then you test that hypothesis uh, and then you see if the results match your hypothesis. Uh, and so when you're trying to do really complicated things like work out exactly how to use your CRISPR in order to build a protein in order to have some kind of outcome like a really super successful drug or something that can eat all the plastic in the ocean, what we do right now with classical computers is the equivalent of sort of building a model of that protein in Lego. 
and we take bloody ages to build this intricate model of this one variation of the infinite space of protein and chemistry that might happen. And then if it doesn't work, you have to take the whole thing apart again and build it again. So one of the applications of quantum uh, computing, which is just impossible today, no matter how much we speed things up and no matter how many AI emergent organic algorithms we have, is modeling of biological and chemical systems for that kind of chemistry engineering, for the real world analog engineering that's just so hard today. That, that sort of thing is, is a quantum leap forward. I have a question on this. So Bitcoin, right, takes... What? Not quantum. <laughs> <laughs> five to ten minutes to process the block. Will quantum destroy that? Or make it... Uh, that's, that's you, honey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the funny part was because I'm married. Oh, I, should, I should say, yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a horrible man. I'm actually married to the <laughs> <laughs> oh, He's allowed. Uh, so, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, phantom... Um, that's a good question. So, um, sorry. For VCs. <laughs> for VCs. Yeah, that's a yeah. good question for VCs. Um, so, uh, I I don't know if it will change anything or not. Sure, the algorithms will be broken slightly, and some of the cryptographic proofs that we are using for uh, blockchain and specifically for Bitcoin with the proof of work, which basically means that I'm trying to solve a riddle um, and the first person to solve a riddle is the person who gets to put the new block into the chain. So if we have something that is able to compute these things and solve their riddle much faster, obviously then uh, the whole process of uh, or the, the challenge becomes uh, just not, not, not useful in any way. Currently we are relying on the fact that computing takes energy and takes time. So the more uh, the, the less en well the more energy I spend the less time it takes me to uh, to figure out the solution to this problem so um, that way I get to put the next uh, block into the blockchain submit my transactions with quantum computing I I will just be able to do it with an instance but as uh, you were saying obviously there it's not like one day we'll all wake up and there will be a quantum world and everything will be broken <laughs> and uh you know the apocalypse day or whatever else <laughs> movie you want to watch all of a sudden all beasts will die because quantum computing arrived and um, that's not how it works it's a slow process and already right now we have a lot of amazing work being done on post-quantum crypto as in cryptography that is uh, that can be then the basis of uh, blockchain and uh, bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and anything else that relies on uh, cryptography cool i'm gonna call time at the moment i'd love to ask these panelists more questions but we started a bit late so we have to move <laughs> on to the next panel we will all be at the pub, most of us. No. Yeah. Yeah. Susan, you yeah. can tell them all about where we're going to be able to have all these amazing conversations. Yes. Oh. On the first hand for our panellists, John, Holly, Martin, Sarah. Another one with Sarah.